Welcome to Yup Master and we're continuing with the chapter of Animal Kingdom. We have also now reached up to the phyla of phylum of Echinodermata. So let's begin. Let me talk about Echinodermata. What exactly is it or which organisms strike your mind? Aren't we talking about the starfish? Yes. So let's begin. We begin with phylum Echinodermata, okay, where the word of Echinodermata, Echin means spines. And derma, as we all know, means skin. So these are those organisms which have got a spiny skin. Okay. Now, when we when we talk about the habit here, these are the organisms which are going to be found only in water. Okay. These are all aquatic, and along with being aquatic, they are found only in marine waters. Okay. Also, we see talking about the habitat of these organisms. These are free living, which means that they are not parasitic. Also, we see that these are sedentary, all right. They are, whatever movements that they do have are very slow movements. You would hardly ever see a starfish or any kind of um, wanting or running or moving very fast, okay. So, these are free living, these are sedentary, these are also seen to be solitary, all right. But along with being solitary, you may also find them in company. Also, we see that when we say that they are found in the deep seas, then where exactly do you actually find them? Echinoderms are basically found in the lowest level of any body of water wherever they, are could, they would be present. So any sea that you have in echinoderm present, it would be always present near the sea bed. Okay, And a word that we are going to be learning for an animal which is found at the sea bed, is called as benthoic. What is it called as? It's called as benthoic. So this word of benthoic, okay, benthoic means when the animal is found at the level of the sea bed, okay. All right, so it is found at the lowest level. Also, we see that they may be fond of company. So look at this diagram, your beautiful diagram of so many starfish all residing near each other. So when these animals or when any organisms are actually fond of having company around them, then those organisms are said to be gregarious, okay? So these are two new words that we're learning here right now on this one slide. One is called as benthoic. What does benthoic mean? That they are found at the lowest level of a body of water. Second is called as gregarious and gregarious means that they are fond of company okay so they like to be amongst them their uh, their own species all right so benthoic and gregarious okay now talking about some other general characteristics belonging to phylum echinodermata when we talk about their body symmetry now look at the different body symmetries i will explain to you right now and when we come to their examples you will see it very clearly why i am saying that these are not only star shaped okay so there could be, uh, they are uh, actually radially symmetrical organisms. They have a symmetry which is a pentameric symmetry. And when we talk about the body shapes, they could be spherical. They could be uh, even elongated or cylindrical. Okay, we can see, we'll see all those also. So the body symmetry was a uh, pentameric symmetry. Body shape like we just spoke about right now, they could be spherical. Okay. They also may be found to be elongated. We will see some uh, echinoderms which are called as sea cucumbers. And these sea cucumbers are seen to be elongated just like that of a cucumber. Or they may be star shaped as we all know that. Okay. They don't have actually a structure which we can define as okay this is the head of that echinoderm. No such structure is present over there. So basically they don't have a well defined head. Okay. They do have an endoskeleton and that endoskeleton which is there is uh, actually basically derived from their mesoderm, okay. So the endoskeleton is derived from mesoderm and that endoskeleton is made up of calcareous ossicles, okay. So now this is something that you need to remember. When we talk about the endoskeleton of an echinoderm, it is made up of calcareous ossicles, okay. And these calcareous ossicles are going to be supporting the spiny structure of this organism. So, remember one thing that the body shape may be spherical, it may be elongated or it may be star shaped, okay. There is no distinct head, there is no well defined head of any kind or a, and they have or they possess 
a mesodermal endoskeleton endoskeleton made up of mesoderm and what is that made up of it is made up of calcareous ossicles and these are the ossicles which are going to be supporting the spines of these organisms we see that all the echinoderms the body wall is going to be thick naturally there are spines present spines cannot be present on very thin body walls so the body wall is going to be thick and we see that the body surface is seen to be spiny now because this body surface is spiny that is why we say that these are echinoderms okay because they have a spiny body surface now sometimes in certain organisms or in certain echinoderms like a, a sea urchin okay like that we see that spines may be modified okay and when the spines are modified they are modified into these structures over here you can see how these modified spines are how they they become elongated and these structures here are called as pedicellariae what are they called as remember this word this word it is called as pedicellariae this is an important word when we're talking about echinoderms so this is these are structures called as pedicellariae and if at all uh, these pedicellariae they can be even uh, modified or they may evolve and on evolution we see that they may evolve to form some toxic claws okay so can you see how this person has been injured with the claws over there okay so it is these are the pedicellariae which have managed to inject itself into the skin of this person and why have why have they injected themselves into the skin because it has behaved as an organ of defense for this echinoderm and when this spine or when this structure is injected inside the person then it does it does initiate a sign of inflammation now there will be redness there will be burning sensation there will be pain over there there will be swelling as well so what is important is that inflammation is supposed to be treated if at all this inflammation is not treated then this could lead to further damage in an, on an internal level and that is why we can say that these toxic claws that i'm talking about okay pedicellaria may be evolved to form toxic claws that's why i say that it may inflict a sense of envenomation okay so envenomation means that this could be proving to be fatal could be poisonous if at all that inflammation which is produced is not taken care of properly okay so can you see how those dots are there and how the spines have been inserted inside the skin just so that this organism can save itself so this over here what you're seeing this is one of the examples that i had told you when the body shape is circular okay so when this body shape is circular you can see the presence of the spines also over there this is a sea urchin all right now talking about some other of uh, some special features when we talk about these echinoderms okay other special features in fact the most special feature here okay and that is a feature which we're going to be calling as the water it's called as a water vascular system okay it's called as a water vascular system now this name might strike a bell if you have attended my previous lectures okay when we learned about the phylum porifera okay remember this phylum porifera okay over there in the porifera we had a system which we called as the water canal system okay so that water canal system was what was that do you remember that there was a substratum and on that substratum you had the poriferan okay and okay so there was a porifera so there were minute pores through which the water would enter in okay so water would enter in through these pores that was called as the ostia okay it would pass through this whole cavity which was called as the it was called as the spongio seal and it would come out through this one opening and that one opening was called as the osculum okay so this is basically how that whole water canal system was working in that of a porifera but when we talk about an echinodermata in echinoderms they have a system which is called as a water vascular system now if i am saying that this is a water vascular system then water 
vascular. When we talk about vascular, what is the meaning of vascular? Vascular means circulation, okay? Or basically vascular means vessels, okay? So here, instead of having blood inside and blood actually uh, circulating all the required nutrients and all, it is actually going to be done here by the water vascular system where first of all water needs to enter into the body and there is a special opening here through which water is able to enter inside the body of this organism and that opening is going to be called as a madriporite. What is it called as? It is called as a madriporite. So this is one more word that we have learned. So four new words we've come across right now. The first word we saw at the lowest level of the, of the ocean that was called as benthoic. Second word we learned was that they are fond of company. We called it as gregarious. The third one we learned was that they are um, having spines on their skin. Okay, the spines are actually can be evolved and they can be called as pedicillariae. And the fourth thing, the fourth new word that we've come across term for this phylum is that they have a structure and that structure is right over here and that structure is called as a madriporite. What is it called as? It's called as a madriporite. Madriporite is that region from where water is going to be able to enter into this organism. So water enters here. Can you see here how beautifully it is shown? that water is actually entering into the body of the echinoderm through this madriporite. Then once water enters in through here, can you see how the water can be able to go down further in and pass through this ring and through the ring it will be able to go to all the arms of this echinoderm. Okay, so now basically what happens is as it goes and passes through the arms of the echinoderms, it is going to be able to reach water to all these structures here and these structures over here are the tube feet, okay? And these tube feet are basically the locomotory organs for these echinoderms, okay? These tube feet that you see here, in this structure that you are seeing here, the tube feet are having small, small opening, these small, small apparatus here which are called as suckers, okay? But there are certain echinoderms where suckers are not going to be present. So we'll see those later. But understand one thing that this madriporite allows water to enter inside. Water passes through this ring here and then water enters into these arms. Okay. The arms are going to allow the water to reach through to these structures here which are called as the tube feet. And tube feet are going to be helpful for locomotion. Okay. All right. So water enters into the madriporite and it is going to take that water into the whole water vascular system of this echinoderm okay so we have the water vascular system here and this is what i just explained to you a little while back where water will enter through this madriporite go inside pass through this whole ring over here okay that is the ring canal as they've they mentioned here and then through the ring canal it is going to pass and radiate to all the different arms okay and allow water to travel all the way there okay so this is how it is radiating and then the water is going to reach to these tube feet in this tube feet this elongated or rather this uh, enlarged region that you're seeing because it is a tube there is an enlarged region to it whenever even in our body if you have a tube and then if you have an enlarged region to it that only that restricted enlarged region is going to be called as the ampulla so in all these tube feet okay in all these tube feet that you're seeing that enlarged region that you're seeing is going to be called as the ampulla okay ampulla basically the scientific word it is just the meaning that in a tube if there is an enlargement, it is going to be called as ampulla. Okay, that was of the tube feet. Now, this whole water vascular system that we saw over here that I have marked in blue over here, this here can be also called as the ambulacral system. Okay, so the water vascular system, don't forget this. Okay, this is the most important part of an echinoderm, the water vascular system. Okay, 
talking about echinoderm, the very first thing that has to strike your mind is a, that there is a water vascular system. And how does water enter into this system? By an opening, which is called as the madriporite. Okay. All right. Also, we see that this whole water vascular system that is there, it is being derived from the coelom itself. And what is it? What exactly are the what exactly are the functions that this system carries off? It helps. Remember, I told you that it provides water to the tube feet. So it is helping this organism to locomote. It helps it capture and to transport of the food inside the body. And it also helps and plays a role in the respiration of this echinoderm. Okay. All right. Now talking about the circulatory system. Well, the circulatory system here is of an open type of circulatory system. It is basically there without any heart. There are no, there is no heart. There are absolutely no blood vessels either. That's why we're calling it as an open type of circulatory system. Talking about the respiratory system here. Respiratory system, well, remember that these are echinoderms. So, the surface of their skin are having spines, right? Well, sometimes we see that in between spines, there are certain outgrowths of the skin, okay? And these outgrowths of the skin can be marked like this here. These are the outgrowths which are seen, okay? These are outgrowths on which the exchange of gases are going to happen. As you can see over here, oxygen can come inside, carbon dioxide is being diffused out. So these outgrowths seen on the skin and between the spines, if this is a spine, these are the outgrowths between two spines. Those outgrowths are called as the papulae. What are they called as? They're called as the papulae. Papula is single, papulae plural. So they are papulae. They may also be called as the dermal branchiae, okay? You may either call it as papulae or you may either call it as dermal branchiae. What are these dermal branchiae? They are thin outgrowths of the body, of the body wall, that too, which are present between the spines. Okay. Now, another system for respiration. Look at this example here. These are those echinoderms which are actually having a cylindrical type of body. Okay. So, these are the cylindrical body ones. Look at this here. They have a structure here which is called as a cloaca. Can you see that cloaca? Well, also I'd like you to note that from the cloaca or rather near the cloaca, can you see these respiratory trees over here? Why are they called as trees? Because look at that. They, they have small branches and at the ends of the branches, they have small tree-like structures. Okay. So that's why and because they open into the cloaca region here, they are also called as the cloacal respiratory trees. These are going to allow these organisms to or uh, rather help these organisms for respiration. Okay. All right. So there are, there are papillae and there are uh, the cloacal respiratory trees present in echinoderms for their respiratory system. Okay. Moving on, we have learned about the circulatory system. We learned about the respiratory system. We learned about how they locomote. We learned about the water canal system. Let's move on and let's see the excretory system. Well, these organisms for excretion, like we like we had seen in certain organisms, how uh, they have a special organ which is specially meant for excretion. These organisms do not have special organ. Excretion, whichever is done, is being done by simply by diffusing out any of the excretory waste products. Okay, so there is basically no special organ for excretion. Whatever it is being done, it is done by simple diffusion. All right. Okay. So, are you ready for some more points? Okay. Let's begin first with some more points here. Talking about, let's not forget the nervous system. Do you think, what do you think? Do you think that these starfish actually have a brain or are they brainless? Well, they are having poorly developed nervous system. They do not have a brain. And their sense organs are also seen to be very poorly developed. Okay, so they're not well developed sense organs either. But there is something which is which is uh, helping in conducting some impulses. And we see that there is a presence of a radial nerve. Okay, where is this radial nerve? Let's see over here. When they've taken a cross section of one of the arms over here, okay, on cross section, it is seen that over here, this small region over here is that of a radial nerve. Okay, so you can see this small region here that is a radial nerve and that radial nerve 
is found to be distributed amongst all the arms of this echinoderm. So there is a ring around the mouth from where it originates from and then the radial nerves in the arms. These are helping in the sensory, uh, sensory part of this echinoderm. Okay. All right. Now, Moving next towards the next system and that is the system of the reproduction. So talking about the reproductive system. Now the question is are sexes separate? Well yes children sexes here are separate. There is going to be a separate male echinoderm and then there will be a separate female echinoderm too. But are the sexes able to be seen separately? And the answer there is no. So we see here sexes are separate. So we may call these organisms to be dioecious. Dioecious means there is a separate male and there is a separate female. But because we don't see externally, we are unable to tell whether the starfish or the echinoderm which you are holding in your hand, is that a male or is that a female? And since there are no special external features seen to distinguish them, they, we can say that there is no sexual dimorphism. Dimorphism would mean where the male and the female are identifiable different, identifiably different. But over here that is not present. Okay. Now over here when we say that uh, there is no sexual dimorphism, then naturally um, and if I am saying that the reproduction is sexual, then naturally we can say that the fusion of gametes that is happening would not be inside the body. The fusion of gametes happening would be external. So we can see here that fertilization that's taking place is usually external fertilization. Okay, so reproduction is sexual and here the fertilization is usually seen to be external. All right. Okay, now development here is indirect development. So indirect development means that there is going to be the presence of a larval form. And we see here that there is a free swimming bilaterally symmetrical larva. Free swimming bilaterally symmetrical larva. As you can see here that both of these organisms, both of these diagrams that are seen here are the larva form of this echinoderm. And you can see how beautifully you can see that it is bilaterally symmetrical. Okay. There is a hypothetical larva which is called as dipurula. And this is actually said to be the ancestor of all the echinoderms, okay. Alright, next talking about another very important uh, property of the echinoderms and that is of regeneration, okay. So the power of regeneration here is actually remarkable, alright. Now here not only is it only regeneration, regeneration we basically think that regeneration happens whenever... Um, a part of it is damaged or injured then uh, that would be just removed off and the animal can regenerate it. Yes, that is the basic form of regeneration. But over here they have, uh, uh, they, some of the echinoderms may exhibit something which is called as autonomy. And when we talk about the autonomy feature, then this means that they have a characteristic where they are able to actually self ampute themselves okay so self amputation what does this mean if they are seeing that some uh, some organism or the enemy has come and maybe that enemy has grabbed hold of one foot of it or one arm has come into the capture then what will this starfish do the starfish will actually be able to detach that one arm which has been captured from the rest of its body so the arm will only be captured and the rest of the body or the rest of the whole organism will be amputated by that organism itself and it can this is the way that it can actually escape itself from that region okay. So this is what we call as autonomy and this is a special feature or a special property of this echinoderms which we can call as self amputation all right okay. Talking about the eating habits of these organisms, well, these uh, echinoderms, they are actually going to be feeding upon the phylum right before them and that is the phylum of molluscans. So can you see here how this starfish is feeding on this mollusk below it, okay? This is a bivalve, can you see that? So the starfish is feeding on that mollusk. 
So these are mostly carnivorous and they mostly feed on the molluscans. Okay. All right. As you can see here, you can see how the mouth of the starfish is located on the ventral side. Okay. When we talk about starfishes, the mouth is found to be located on the ventral region. Whereas the anus is found to be located on the dorsal side and that is exactly where as you can see here. Can you see this part here? Can you remember what was the name of that part? That part was called as the madriporite. Okay and what did the madriporite basically lead it into? It led it to the whole system which we call as the water vascular system okay we call it as a water vascular system all right now most important coming to the examples here now when we talk about the examples here the very first example when we see that the body shape is circular that is of an echine uh, of an echinus and echinus is the scientific name which is used for the common word which is called as the sea urchin do you remember what these spines were called as? Do you remember we had called them as pedicillariae? What, is, what was this pedicillariae? They were nothing but evolved spines which are present on the skin. Alright. So, after sea urchin, let's move on to the next example. That is of the starfish or the sea star. And because it is star, you can give it the name of aster. Okay. So, asterius and asterius is called as the, is another name for starfish. Next. Something just like a starfish, but over here, as you can see, the arms are extremely long. Okay, so can you see how I've highlighted in this red color the different arms of this? Okay, so these are also called as Ophiuria or they may be called as the brittle star. Okay, all right. Next, when we talk about the next echinoderm, these are cucumeria. Look at this cucumeria. Why is it called as cucumeria? It looks just like a cucumber. And that's why we're going to be calling it as the elongated echinoderm and it is called as the sea cucumber. Okay, this is the sea cucumber. Here also you can see that even though it is a sea cucumber type of shape, there are spines on the skin. Okay, that's what's making, keeping it as an echinoderm. Then there is another example we see. That example is of antidon. Antidon may also be a name used for the sea lily. Okay. Sea lily are those echinoderms which are basically going to be attached. These are not those echinoderms which are freely swimming in the water. Okay, so they're going to be having a, uh, an attachment. They're going to be sessile. Okay, all right. So these are some examples that we see here. Next, when we talk about the classification. Okay, so we basically we're done with the general characteristics of the phylum echinodermata. Now we move on towards the two subphyla which are seen. Okay. So here we understand first of all that there are two subphyla. The first subphyla, read the words very carefully. It is called as pelmatozoa. What is it called as? It's called as pelmatozoa. The second subphylum is called as the eleutherozoa. What is it called as? It's called as the eleutherozoa. Okay. So two subphylums belonging to this phylum of echinodermata. First is called as the pelmatozoa and second is called as eleutherozoa okay all right now when we talk about this first subphylum pelmatozoa before going into the different classes of it okay let us see basically what are the different or what are the general characteristics of the pelmatozoa first of all these are sessile do you remember when we were learning about the examples i told you that this ones are sessile which one did i tell talk about i talked about the sea lilies okay so the sessile means that they're going to be attached to a substratum and the examples here are the sea lilies which are attached to the substratum there sometimes uh, they may not also be attached to the substratum they may be found to be freely swimming in the water and the example here are very beautiful looking organism look at that there it's called as the feather stars okay so these are the freely swimming pelmatozoans all right Next, some other features that we see here that the mouth and the anus are present both on the upper surface, okay. That is the, and it is also going to be called as the oral surface where both mouth and anus are present, okay. 
Here we see that there is absolutely no madreporite. So if there is no madreporite, then there is no opening for the water vascular system. Okay, so there's no opening for that. Then coming next to uh, other points when we talk about the pelmatozoa, talking about the classes, okay, there is basically only one class involved here. And in Pelmatozoa, the one class which is seen to be present is only that of the Crinoidea, okay. Pelmatozoa is the name of the subphylum. Crinoidea is the name of the class, okay. Only one class seen over here. And look at this here. Can you see, first of all, I'd like you to just take a minute. Look at the diagram that's given here, okay. It's a beautiful diagram. The upper part that you're seeing over here is called as the crown, okay. The next part that you're seeing over here is known as the stem and the third part that you're seeing over here, these structures that you're seeing here are called as the cirri, okay, cirri, all right. So we, we see here that uh, these crinoidea or the pelmatozoans, these are the oldest and the most primitive forms of the echinoderms which, we, which are able to be seen, okay. Some are seen to be which are going to be stockless and they are free moving, okay. Some of them, whereas may be stalked as well. The viscera inside means all the body structures, whatever is present inside, that viscera may be enclosed in a calcareous shell, okay, and that calcareous test or that calcareous shell like apparatus is going to be called as the theca. What is it called as? It's called as the theca, okay. Now, here are, there are going to be the tube feet present. Remember, I showed you tube feet when I, when I showed you the starfish. The tube feet will be present, but there are no suckers at the end of the tube feet. So we say that the tube feet do not bear suckers, okay. Also, we see that there is going to be no madreporite, there are no spines and remember this word, it was called as pedicillariae. So madreporite, spines and those outgrowths on the spine, on the skin, that is the pedicillaria on the sea urchins. All of those are absent here, okay? So they are not present. That's why I say that these are very primitive ones, okay? So that's with the first phylum. Coming to the next subphylum and that next subphylum is called as Eleutherozoa. Now, when we talk about this Eleutherozoa, these first talking about the, some of the very basic general characteristics and then we see that over here, there is not only one class, but there are going to be actually four classes involved here, okay? So talking about this Eleutherozoa, these are freely moving. There is no stalk-like apparatus which is going to make it bound to a substratum, okay? The mouth is directed downwards, which means that on ventral position, we have the mouth which is present. Madriporites are going to be present here too. So madriporites are going to be leading it towards the water vascular system. Please, children, don't forget this whole system of water vascular, water vascular system and the opening for that through which water is able to enter in, that opening is going to be called as the madriporite, okay? So here in Eleutherozoans, madriporite is present, okay? Now, these subphylum of Eleutherozoa have got four classes. How many classes? There are basically four classes here. So, first class is called as Asteroidea, okay. First is called as Asteroidea. When we talk about Asteroidea, does this ring a bell? Asteroidea means aster and aster always means star, okay. Aster, aster always means star. All right. Second class that we are finding here is called as the Ophiuroidea, okay. First is Asteroidea, second is Ophiuroidea, third is going to be called as the Echinoidea, okay. Third is Echinoidea, so first is Asteroidea, second is Ophiuroidea, third is Echinoidea. Fourth is going to be called as the Holothuroidea, Holothuroidea, okay. Break up the words and that's the only way you'll be able to remember it. Asteroidea. Ophiuroidea, Echinoidea, and fourth being Holithuroidea. Okay, now starting with the very first one, and that is the Asteroidea. 
asteroid or aster i told you this is the another name for star so these are the examples which are going to be our sea stars or the starfish okay so the sea stars here first of all there is a structure which is called as an ambulacral groove what are these ambulacral grooves let's see over here can you see this part over here this is what you call as an ambulacral groove okay the same over here also all of these here on in each of the arms you can see the presence of this ambulacral grooves okay so here are those ambulacral grooves present here okay now we also see here that in this diagram can you see this here this is that groove these here are those ambulacral grooves that i was talking about okay so in this file in this uh, class of the starfishes of the asteroidia we see that the ambulacral grooves remain or have a tendency to remain open so this means that there are going to be other uh, classes where we will see that the ambulacral grooves are closed in the starfish they are open all right also we see here that the remember that pedicellariae yes the spiny structures here the pedicellariae are two jawed okay look at that here two jaws here one jaw over here okay and another jaw over here so we are seeing that the pedicellariae are two jawed okay they are going to be helping in capturing the food okay they help in protection and they help to capture the surface of the body look at this diagram here okay i'd like you to pay attention to this figure over here now in this figure can you see how there are going to be pedicellaria present in this ventral region and can you see how it has caught hold of its own food okay can you see how it has managed to cling on to the food and basically this is how the jaws are going to in uh, going to grab hold of the food over there so that's how it is opening and that's how it is closing over here okay so pedicellaria here are two jawed and they are going to be used in capturing food in protection and also help and the capture of the surface of the body all right i hope you understood this whole part here of the pedicellaria which are present in starfish when we saw the sea urchins those pedicellaria were elongated and they were helping that sea urchin as a defense mechanism okay all right as spines here the madreporite which is present do you remember what madreporite was madreporite was an opening for water to enter water to enter into the water which system it was called as the water vascular system okay it was called as a water vascular system so here we see that the madreporite is ab oral now what is ab oral uh, when we talk about generally we say ventral and dorsal when we talk about the starfish the part where the mouth is okay that is the ventral part we can call that as the oral part and the opposite end that is on the dorsal part we can call that end as the ab oral part so there is an oral region and then there is an ab oral region okay so here we see that the madreporite is seen to be ab orally present that is how it is written here that that is that on the dorsal surface okay so madreporite present here this is the madreporite over here and can you see in this in this diagram here how the madreporite is beautiful diagram of a small madreporite present there okay all right examples from this class would be the starfish which is called as astropectin okay it's called as astropectin the next example it is called as the asterius okay astropectin and the asterius all right now coming to the next class that we see here the next class is that of the ophiuroidea it's called as ophiuroidea okay now in these ophiuroidias we find the a little bit uh, longer arms than that of a starfish and we call these arms as the or we call these organisms as the brittle stars okay you can call it as the brittle stars you may call these as the serpent stars or you may also call it as basket stars so basically what you see here is that they are going to be having long 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 arms and do you know how they are going to be moving by the whipping movements of these arms okay that is how this organism is going to be locomoting okay so this is of the class called as ophiuroidea all right here as we, as i said right now the arms are long they are flexible they are fragile and they may be branched as well okay so these are the characteristics there 
So arms can be branched. Look at this here. How we, we give an example of arms being branched over here. Okay. This is also called as gorgonocephalus. Okay. Can you see that here? Gorgonocephalus. How you can see beautifully the arms are being branched here. All right. Okay, so let's see the examples here. This is called as Gorgonocephalus. It is also commonly called as a basket star. Okay, so this is a basket star. Then there is another example here, a spiny brittle star and this is called as the Ophiothrix. Okay, spiny brittle star called as Ophiothrix. All right. Coming towards the next or the third category of classes that we have and that is called as the echinoidea. Okay, echinoidea. Now, echine means spines and these are the organisms from all of those echinoderms. These are the organisms which we are, in which we are seeing maximum spines present here. So, when we talk about these, these are the sea urchins. Okay, now when we talk about the sea urchins, the body shape is void like how we see here in the sea urchin. Otherwise, the body shape may also be discoid shape. Look at that organism there. Can you even believe that it is an organism? Well, it is. And this is an organism which we call as a sand dollar. Okay, it's called as a sand dollar. And this is a discoid shape which is seen in category of these classes. Here, as you can see in both the examples, that arms are absent and whatever tube, whatever locomotion uh, structures are there, that is the tube feet. The tube feet here do not have any struck, any suckers present, okay. Tube feet will be present, but like how starfish have suckers at the end of the tube feet, here they do not have those, okay. Then also we see here um, that the madriporite, which is there, the madriporite and the anus both, they are ab oral in position, which means that they are present on the dorsal side, okay. So, madriporite. What was madriporite? Madriporite was the opening for water to enter into this echinoderm and the anus. Okay, they both are anus. Both of these structures are ab oral in position, and ab oral always means they are dorsal in position, which means that the mouth is the only part which is going to be ventral in position. Okay, so here if you see, this is the ab oral region. This will be the oral region, okay, and this is from the side view, you can say the lateral. All right, okay, so madriporite present over there. Then, when we talk about the mouth in these regions, okay, the mouth of the sea urchin, there is in these sea urchins, okay, so there is a apparatus which has got five jaws one, okay, this is the second one, third, fourth, and fifth. So, the presence of these uh, five jaws, okay, is also there and it is going to be helping jaws. So, basically, it's going to be helping it in chewing. Another name for chewing is called as mastication. So, mastication basically means chewing. So, this is a complex five-jawed masticatory apparatus. So, this five-jawed masticatory apparatus is going to be called as the Aristotle's lantern. What is it called as? It's called as Aristotle's lantern. Okay. Now, let's see the examples which are there of this, of this cl uh, class here. The first one, as I told you that these are the sea urchins. Okay. The scientific name for sea urchin, we learned it as, it was called as the echinus. Second, echinocardium, okay, it is also called as the heart urchin, where it looks like a heart shape, okay. So, echinus, echinocardium, all right. Also, look at this sea urchin over here, okay, it is called as, let me just go away for a minute, okay. This here, it is the cake urchin, okay, it is also scientifically, scientifically, you can call it as clypester, okay, the cake urchin, all right. And uh, look at the last one, that is the sand dollar that we spoke about a little while back, okay, it is also like a disc shape, I told you it was discoid, like a disc, discoid, hence it is called as the echinodiscus, okay, sand dollar or echinodiscus, alright. Now, moving on to the last class which is there of the second subphylum and that last class is called as the holothuroidea, okay, holothuroidea, now. These are none other than those very elongated cylindrical uh, echinoderms 
which we call as the sea cucumbers. What do we call them as? We call them as sea cucumbers. Now, here we see that the body is elongated and also we see that they have an oro uh, an oro arboral axis, okay? The, the body wall seen here, can you see here how um, it's actually looking very beautiful, isn't it? It, it is a, a leathery, a, a shiny body wall present here, okay? There are tube feet present and the tube feet do have suckers just like the tube feet of a starfish, all right? We also see that the mouth may be surrounded by retractable tentacles, okay, as you can see here that these are tentacles present and the mouth may be surrounded by it which can come in and go out at the same time, okay. The feet here do bear suckers as well, okay. Also, we see the madreporite is present but unlike the starfish here, the madreporite would be internal and allows the water to enter inside the water vascular system, all right. Here, these are the organisms like we just saw when we spoke about the respiratory system that it is the sea cucumbers which are having the cloaca present and from in the uh, attached to the cloaca are these trees here which we're calling as the respiratory trees, okay. So respiratory organs seen in this class are a pair of cloacal respiratory trees present, okay, all right. Look at this other example. This is also called as the holotho. Uh, it was, it's called as the holothuria. Okay, holothuria, like we just saw in the first example. Also, another one seen here is synaptia. Okay, can you see how these are those tentacles that the retractable tentacles we were speaking about? Okay, another example here. Look at this here. All right, all right. So basically, and one more here, thione. Okay, the thione present. That is the sea cucumber. Okay, of this shape here. Yeah. All right. So children, uh, summing up this whole session about echinoderms, the spiny, spiny skinned animals that we spoke about, let's just first of all, first uh, go ahead and recollect the gender characteristics that we have seen amongst these organisms. First of all, we saw that they are exclusively marine. Okay. They are marine. Then we also saw according to their habitat that they are found at the lowest levels of the body of the seawater and that low level of the body of seawater was called as benthoic. Okay, it was called as benthoic. We also saw that they are very fond of company for which we learned a new word and that word was called as gregarious. Okay, it was called as gregarious. All right. So they are marine, they are benthoic, they are gregarious, fond of company. Also, when we talk about the body symmetry, well, they are bilateral symmetry, okay. And the starfish kind of ones, they even have pentameris. They have pentameris symmetry. Okay, what are the points that we learn about these very important ones? We saw that uh, the circulatory system here is going to be an open. So it is open circulatory system okay when we talk about the respiratory system well there were structures which were called as the papillae or they may also be called as dermal also called as dermal branchiae and what about in the sea urchin? Uh, what about in the sea cucumbers? Remember, sea cucumbers were having those structures which we called as the, we call those as the cloacal respiratory trees. So, do you remember those? Okay, that was for the respiratory system. What about the excretory system? There was no special excretory organ. So how did they excrete out? By diffusion, all right. Then what about the special feature that we saw here? The most important special feature was that of, most important special feature was that of the water vascular system. Okay, this water vascular system had a small opening for letting water enter inside it and that opening was called as the madreporite. Okay, it was called as the madreporite. Then 
this water vascular system helped this organism to locomote okay capture food also helped it respire all right okay so that was all about the water vascular system the most important system seen in an echinoderm all right also after the special features we saw when we talk about the reproduction do you remember the points of reproduction in reproduction we saw that the sexes are separate okay so sexes are seen to be separate but okay sex is separate means we can call it as dioecious okay but they are not externally identifiable different so we say that they do not do not have sexual dimorphism sexes are separate but there is no sexual dimorphism okay we see here that in spite of all this we see that they are going to be reproducing they reproduce sexually and because they are going to be reproducing sexually that's and because there is no sexual dimorphism can i say that the fertilization will be external okay so fertilization will be external the gametes will be fusing in the water itself the development here development is indirect where there is larva form is present okay so basically children these are the different points that we have learned about um, echinodermatas okay the different examples we saw we had seen example of sea urchin example of the brittle star example of the sea lily sea lily was an example where it is not free living it is not sorry rather it is not freely swimming but it is attached to a substratum with the help of a stalk okay so all of these examples we saw asteroidia that is of the starfish so many different examples we have seen right now okay so this is all about this is all about what phylum echinodermata is going to be about now i'd like you to also refer this phylum according to your ncrt textbook we have covered all the points for ncrt textbook from ncrt textbook which is required for your need but we have also taken you a level beyond that so that those extra questions which may arise up in your neat exams are not skipped by you all right so children i'd like you to make sure that you continue watching our lectures do make notes from this chapter because children remember that this chapter is one of the most important chapters for your neat exam okay so basically because you're talking about kingdom animalia here the whole animal kingdom is covered here as we have seen that in the invertebrates and followed by we're going to be learning about the vertebrates also we're going to see how all the different systems are covered and when you come to class 12 you see you're going to be learning about so many different physiological chapters here so they actually in your neat exam the chapters of your physiology chapters of animal kingdom are going to be mixed and from there you will be finding different mcqs arising up so your base your base your whole um, foundation for your neat exam when we are talking about zoology would be this chapter of kingdom animalia because here all the different animals are there all their different properties are there and also most important are the examples examples not only do you need to know the common names but also you need to know their scientific names so the next thing you do would be as we are completing invertebrates one by one you would go take your ncrt textbook and from that textbook i'd like you to jot down or just in a separate you can make a chart for yourself jot down just the the examples from the different phyla okay all the different examples have to be learned by heart not only the example even their scientific name don't forget their scientific names too all right so children do stay tuned do stay with me in our chapters of kingdom animalia and the following ones our next uh, lecture will be on hemichordata and then we'll be beginning with the chordates all right 
So um, if this lecture was good and if you found this lecture helpful for you, please do uh, hit the like button, do uh, give me a comment and also I'd love it if you'd subscribe to our page. And also if you hit the bell icon, then you will be able to get further notifications whenever my lectures are uploaded, all right? So you guys stay home and stay safe during this pandemic and uh, 